Este es un, un espacio que inicialmente pensamos que iba a ser presencial eh, con Stephen Downs, que es un, un investigador canadiense que trabaja en temas de conectivismo, ah, conectivo, ah. conectivo eh, y, y pues todo lo que implica desde el punto de vista de la tecnología, pero por razones eh, de pasaporte, el pasaporte de Stephen está atrapado en, en la embajada del de, consulado de Brasil, en, en Moncton. Así que, pues, no pudo viajar y acordamos eh, tenerlo a través de videoconferencia para, para conversar un rato. Um, la idea de la conversación es, pues, de pronto algunos de, algunos de ustedes serán temas eh, con los que se encuentran por primera vez, para otros ya los habrán visto en otras ocasiones, um, pero la idea es conversar un poco respecto a los retos y respecto al, a, las, a las grandes... Eh, los grandes, sí, en general los grandes retos que tenemos cuando pensamos en aprendizaje en red y cuando pensamos en cómo se, cómo se puede implementar eso en nuestros espacios educativos. La, la propuesta que hemos hecho con Stephen es que esto sea más una conversación, obviamente, ¿sí? va a ser creo, una presentación corta al inicio y, y luego eh, pues vamos a tener una conversación más abierta. Además de quienes están aquí en el taller de Proyecto 50, nos acompañan algunas personas eh, a través del sistema vídeo. Entonces, al, eh, algunos están cerca, otros están en distintos lugares del país, que a todos les damos la bienvenida. Eh, algunos de ellos son personas de los centros de, centros de innovación de otras universidades de Colombia. Entonces, bienvenidos, gracias por acompañarnos. Y, ¿qué más les cuento? Um, tal vez que... El, 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 terminando ya... Eh, cuando hablamos de aprendizaje en red, no estamos hablando solamente de aparatos. Aprender en red no significa tener el último aparato y ser capaz de conectarse a tal red o a tal sitio web. El, la, la, la perspectiva que va a brindar Stephen eh, es que, si bien tenemos un aliado enorme en la tecnología, eh, lo que significa pensar en red significa de alguna manera cambiar la manera como hemos percibido el entorno durante muchísimo tiempo. Venimos, todos nosotros, me atrevo a decir, de una época de redes encalcadas. De, eh, el profesor se paraba así de, en muchos escenarios y era el que tenía el libro, el que sabía las cosas, y tenía que contárselas a otros. Y eso se replica en nuestro medio de comunicación y en otro montón de, de escenarios de nuestra vida. Cuando tenemos abundancia de información, el asunto cambia. Y significa que la gente tiene posibilidad de acceder de manera directa cosas a las que antes solo tenía acceso a un docente. Eso cambia la regla del juego. Que todos seamos productores eh, cambia un montón la, la, la regla del juego. Que todos tengamos la posibilidad de acceder a información de todo tipo cambia la regla del juego. Y estamos en un periodo de transición. Eh, algunas personas dicen que no es una época de cambio, sino un cambio de época. Eh, estamos en, en, en un momento en donde estamos redescubriendo lo que, lo que podemos hacer y de alguna manera creando. Así que la invitación en parte es a que eh, pues, nos acerquemos un poquito más a estos temas. Y, y nos imaginemos hacia dónde podríamos ir y qué posibles eh, barreras nos podemos encontrar. Entonces, bueno, le voy a dar la, <coughs> la palabra a Stephen, que es, de hecho, quien era. Le voy a dar la palabra a Stephen y, y de nuevo gracias por acompañarnos a quienes están en línea, a quienes están aquí en P50. Uh, Stephen, you're up. Um, I, I, I did a short introduction, but. Um, Well, I think you have a short presentation, and then we go to a conversation, right? Good. Yeah. Good. So, I'm welcome. Not Thank sure you for joining us. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> That works <laughs> also. <laughs> so, quiero quiero pedirles a quienes nos acompañan en línea, por favor, cierren sus micrófonos para. Para, para que no tengamos interferencia, eh, tenemos también a dos personas de México, que son los que saben pantalla en este momento, así que bienvenidos, eh, Francisco, bienvenida Liliana, bienvenida Nilda, son personas del Centro de Pensamiento de la Universidad y Peso de Guadalajara, eh, también vienen trabajando con, con EACI en algunos de esos temas. Entonces, bienvenidos, eh, welcome Stephen, thanks for joining us, and, ok, you're up. Ok, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. If, I'm, if I look like I'm looking around, uh, it's because I have three screens in front of me and I have a, a couple of things on the go here. Um, but uh, 
It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you. I want to first of all extend my apologies for not being able to be with you in person. Uh, as as, uh, as I think Diego explained in Spanish, which I didn't quite follow, uh, it was due to circumstances beyond my control having to do with the non-availability of my passport. But I do intend to travel to Colombia hopefully to be able to talk with all of you and others in person sometime in the next year um, to make up for that. But uh, I do, as Diego said, have a short presentation. And uh, what I want to talk about today is, the, uh, is uh, about the subject of the challenges and the future of network learning. Now let's see if I got this right. And there's always a little delay before it pops up. Um, oh, oh, right, wrong one. Sorry about that. This is one of the challenges of network learning is regression to infinity. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> so. This is where I do a lot of my thinking about networks far away from the internet. It's a coastline on Prince Edward Island in Canada. And it's interesting to be out in that sort of environment because it reminds me that uh, you know, knowledge and learning aren't about books and facts. Knowledge and learning are about the world and are about being connected with the world. And if there's an underlying theme to the work that I do overall, it's this theme of being in the world, being connected to the world, and being connected to each other. So let's look at what we're going to talk about overall uh, in this short presentation. And I will, Diego, try to keep it reasonably short. Uh, I want to talk about what network learning is to begin with to give us a baseline for our discussion. I want to talk about the skills related to network learning. And I want to talk about dependence and independence as they're related to network learning. So what is network learning? Uh, the official definition from, shall we say, Wikipedia is that network learning is a process of developing and maintaining connections with people and information and communicating in such a way so as to support one another's learning. And the central term in this definition is connections. Well, what does that mean from our perspective? What is the core idea here? Uh, the core idea is that instruction, or the mere presentation and absorption of information, does not equate to learning. Simply taking a bunch of content and presenting it in some sort of sequence to people, that's not what creates learning. And as Sean Michael Morris and Jesse Strummel say, this is the fundamental flaw of traditional learning management systems and even most modern open online course systems. The core idea of network learning is that learning takes place in the interactions. Dave Cornier talks about a concept he calls rhizomatic learning. And he says, curriculum is not driven by predefined inputs from experts. It is constructed and negotiated in real time by the contributions of those engaged. This community acts as the curriculum, spontaneously shaping, constructing, and reconstructing itself 
and the subject of its learning. This is a very different way of thinking about learning, isn't it? Uh, this is a way of thinking about learning where there is not a predefined body of content that we want to master, that we know that we want to master ahead of time. It's not a view of learning where there is an authority or an expert who knows everything and will dispense his wisdom to us. It's a theory of learning where the core is discussion and interaction with each other and where we as a group actually, I don't even want to say negotiate, but actually create what it is that we'll be learning together. And this is as true for an individual learning as it is true for a group or a team or a cooperative who are learning. Now we've had experience in this um, and by we uh, I talked for example particularly about Diego Leal who's right in the room with you and myself a really good example of networked learning and the sort of thing that I'm talking about was the EduCamp Columbia project that Diego initiated, I think it was in 2007, right Diego? It was, it was, it was something like that. And the idea here at EduCamp Columbia was that we had large rooms, you can sort of see me there in the, in the picture on the right, uh, sort of wandering around in these large rooms um, with people scattered around, not all in rows listening to some professor. And there are stations that were set up looking at different aspects of the topic that we were interested in. And people could go from station to station and just talk informally about the subject. And you can see in the picture on the left, you see a group clustered around the large video screen in the background and then another group sort of a little bit to the upper left and then another group and the idea that is that it's very informal, it's very fluid and it's based on the conversations. These may happen around some object which might be uh, a, a, you know, a software application or a car engine or whatever or the conversation may simply be a conversation of, about ideas uh, in which people exchange their thoughts and their beliefs with each other. The idea here is that network learning is more than just banking. Uh, meaningful learning occurs with knowledge construction or not, I prefer to say knowledge creation not reproduction, through conversation, not reception, through articulation, and that's a theme that will run through the rest of this discussion, not repetition, through collaboration, or as I like to say, cooperation, not competition, and through reflection, thinking for ourselves, key, not prescription. I have my own theory of learning. It's called the Downs theory of learning. And it's ironic because it's too simple to be a theory. And it's not really mine. It's been stated by many people over centuries. And the theory is this. To teach is to model and demonstrate. To learn is to practice and reflect. And that changes what we think of as learning. To learn is to practice and reflect. That's very different from an idea where to learn is to sit at your desk and listen with your hands folded. It's a totally different approach to learning. Why do we change this? Why is this important? Let me look at the what we might think of as the potential of network learning from the perspective of a broader conception of knowledge. And I have different ways of talking about this in different presentations. 
I'm going to talk about it a bit differently than I usually do today, but I think this is a good way of looking at it. And this is from David Jackson and Julie Temperley, and it looks at three different kinds of knowledge. Uh, maybe they're real kinds, maybe they're not, but they're really three different perspectives on what knowledge is and what knowledge could be. On one hand, we have what we might call public knowledge. You know, and this is, this is the knowledge that we get from theory, that we get from research. It's the knowledge that we share. It's the knowledge that's in books, uh, that we pass and run with each other. Uh, sometimes we might call it social knowledge. Sometimes we might call it socially constructed knowledge. Certainly it's the most intentional and the most out there kind of knowledge. But that's just one kind of knowledge. The, another kind of knowledge is practitioner knowledge. Um, Michael Polanyi called it uh, tacit knowledge. Uh, this is the knowledge of the person who is directly involved with the thing. Uh, this is the knowledge that the plumber has about what really works when you're putting pipes together. Uh, as, as opposed to the knowledge that you might find in books. This is the, the years of experience that he gains. This is his outlook and perspective on life. A plumber sees the world as a series of pipes. And this way of seeing the world is part of the plumber's knowledge. You're not going to find that in books. A physicist, someone who studies physics, will see the world differently. A plumber will see flows, a physicist will see atoms. They're looking at exactly the same thing, but they look at the world differently. This is personal knowledge, uh, and that, that's what Polanyi also called it. That's the name of his book, Personal Knowledge. So right away, we have two different kinds of knowledge. And then there's a third kind of knowledge, new knowledge. Uh, and this is the kind of knowledge that, by definition, you can't put it into a textbook and it's not going to be uh, known by the person who's instructing or who's an expert. It's the knowledge that actually gets created through the process of interaction, one person with the other, many people with objects and, and artifacts in the world. So. These three forms of knowledge intermesh with each other. These three forms of knowledge inform each other. These three forms of knowledge in some important ways result from the interactive process. As a consequence, when we think about network learning as interactive learning, what we are doing is producing this broader conception of knowledge rather than a fairly narrow conception of knowledge. And we talked just quickly and briefly about how we support this model of learning. There's two perspectives of, of looking at it. One perspective is from, shall we say, the, the governmental or the institutional or the service provider perspective. This is kind of the macro perspective. And, and this is the sort of thing that we should be thinking about when we're talking about education policy, learning policy, uh, and how to build learning systems. And there's four major areas that governments and service providers need to be thinking about. First of all, is actually building the networks. One of the things that brought me into Columbia in the first place in 2006 was something that was called at the time the Education Revolution. And that was conjoined with the building of a high-speed backbone, uh, internet backbone, uh, across Columbia. I've forgotten what the name of it was, but, but it was something in Spanish. Um, this is a key role. This is a key role for schools. This is a key role for institutions. Today, you cannot function without that physical network. 
So that's job one. The second thing, though, is, is, is a little less intuitively obvious, mapping and analyzing. Mapping and, and analyzing the, uh, the network. It's interesting because you might think, well, you build a network, everybody can connect to everything. And that's true, but once the network gets too large, you can't find anything. Uh, and, and you don't know what's there, and, and you don't know what shapes there are overall. One of the major ways new knowledge is created in a network is by recognizing patterns of interaction in the network, but these don't necessarily just jump out at you. So there needs to be mechanisms to help you map the network, to analyze the network. It's the sort of service that's provided by Google, it's the sort of service that's provided by a web page, which is a home page for an institution. Uh, it's the sort of service that's provided by various tools and applications that allow us to go from one service to the next, from one place to the next. It's kind of an infrastructure thing. So now we have the network, now we have the map of the network. The next thing we need is the supporting of community on the network. And this is an even softer skill, if you will. That's probably how we would describe it. And the idea here is to create the environment where it is possible and permissible for people to exchange and interact directly, person to person or peer to peer on this network. Uh, you know, there is a technical aspect to it. On the internet, this would be the creation of the internet protocols that allow us to send messages, the email protocol or the web page protocol. But even more significantly, this is just the understanding that we can have languages and ideas that we share with each other, uh, that there is an exchange of ideas uh, that there is an openness in the network, and there are elements of what I would call the semantic condition that supports the sort of interactive network that I'm talking about. And then finally, fourth, expanding boundaries. Uh, once you have a network, making your network larger, opening it up to new possibilities, new members, new forms of input, new ways of experiencing the world. Uh, making your network interactive, if you will, with other networks. Another way of looking at supporting network learning is at the micro scale, and that's the role of the educator. And I wrote a few years ago that the educator's educator's role is redefined in some significant ways in network learning. It's so not that we get rid of the, net, of the educator. A lot of people are, are really worried when they think about new forms of learning because when we think about network learning and we think about it no longer being about an expert who presents points of view or opinions, people fear that, oh, then there's not going to be any jobs for teachers. Uh, which is silly. Um, there's still going to be jobs for teachers. There's still going to be jobs for people who do what I'm doing right now, who actually present a bit of content. That doesn't go away. But the role of the educator becomes far broader and indeed probably breaks into many different parts. So there's whole disciplines uh, that now constitute what we used to think of as, as educator. Um, you know, the, 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 per, the scientists studying solar, uh, solar bears, polar bears, uh, that's an educator. Uh, the person who designs learning resources, that's an educator, but so is the person who creates online videos. So is the person who designs and orchestrates an online community. So is the person who is a programmer and programs massive open online games or learning environments. So is the person who coaches and supports a person. A specific role, for example, 
for a person to act as, if you will, a student advocate, a person who is on the side of the student or on the side of the learner and helps them negotiate their way through uh, educational institutions. Uh, something I could have used when I was a student because there's nothing like trying to negotiate with the registrar's office and it's just you versus that great big institution. Um, there's a model that I often refer to called the triad model um, or the learning provider host framework sometimes subtitled and the triad model really is formed of three major elements and, and those three elements are essentially See if I, oh, <laughs> I tried to do a quick search for a triad model and I've got all kinds of triad models now. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's not better. <laughs> I typed in my name and there's a model called Katie Down. I don't want to anyhow. Uh, yeah, that, that'll probably work. No, no. Okay, I can't get I can't get the image quickly, so I'm going to abandon that. The, the the three points of the triad are first of all at the top, the student, obviously, or the learner. Um, I said I'm giving up, but I'm not really. <laughs> I do sometimes lie about these things. Uh, no, still not coming up. Okay, uh, the second element is if you will, the content provider or the expert or, you know, sometimes it's the publisher. Uh, it's a person who provides the, the materials for learning. Um, and then the third is the local host institution. We actually right now in this discussion are instantiating the triad model. All of you, I'm pointing at you, all of you, you and you and you and you, I'm just going for the 3D effect there, uh, you're one point. I'm another point of the triad, right? And then Diego, who is over here to me, uh, yes, is he is the, the host or the facilitator. He is in, in the interaction between you and me, he is your agent. He is your representative. But, but more, he's the guy who finds someone like me and brings him to you. So that's the triad model in action. And it's interesting, you know, we, we talked, and this is a bit of an aside, but it's an important aside. We talked when we talk about network learning, we talk a lot about the internet and technology and all of that. But network learning is a concept as much as it is, even more than it is, about the technology. We could do the triad model without any technology at all. We could do it in a room, like at EduCamp, right, where everybody's in the same place and somebody is new who's a learner, somebody who's a bit more experienced knows the learner and helps them navigate through the various people and the various artifacts that are in the room. These roles still get played and the many other roles in, in education still get played whether online or offline. The role of coach, the, the, the role of mentor, the role of assessor or person who gives grades, uh, the role of bureaucrat who keeps track of all the student records. The only difference really is that with technology, these roles become separated or as we say, disaggregated. And so people become more specialized. 
they become more likely to focus on one or another aspect of education. I'm you know, talking about network learning, and I, I mentioned earlier something called the semantic condition. And the semantic condition is intended to describe what makes good networks. And so, from our perspective here, we can think of it as a way of framing the sort of skills that are required to be successful in network learning. So you, you see what's happening, right? We become part of the network, so whatever makes a network successful is also what makes us successful. And that kind of makes sense because we also are a network. Remember I talked about the different kinds of knowledge. There's public knowledge or social knowledge. That's one kind of network. That's the network we see in society. There's personal knowledge or tacit knowledge. That's another kind of network. That's the network that exists in our head, our neural network. And the new knowledge is the network that's created through the interaction and the activity of these networks, either alone or in combination. So these are the skills. Uh, and this is a list that I've come up with. It might not be the only list. It might not be authoritative. It's something certainly that needs to be empirically validated through experience. But I suggest this as a starting point. First of all, autonomy, or sorry, first of all, diversity in knowledge, expertise, and application. And this is related to the idea of there not being any single uh, core content that what's learned in a course is negotiated. Uh, each of us comes to a course or a community or a domain of knowledge from a certain perspective. And the idea is that the knowledge is composed of the interaction between multiple different perspectives on the same thing. It's like the old story, the elephant. One person sees a trunk, another person sees a tusk, another person sees a leg. They each think of the elephant from a different perspective. But the story about the elephant as a whole is told by talking about all of the different perspectives together. But for that to work, you have to have different perspectives. If everybody learns the, exactly the same thing and sees the world exactly in the same way, we can never generate new knowledge. We can never grow. We can never learn new things. So diversity is essential. But it's also a rule for learners, right? For a person who is learning, obtain a diversity of experience. That's why I go to the, to the mountains that's why I go to Prince Edward Island, to the to the shores. That's why I try to travel as much as I can. Also, diversity and expertise. It's very common for expertise in one domain to cross over to another domain. A person who is a physicist studying the nature of the universe brings his knowledge of how to knit or, or how to sew into that, and maybe comes up with string theory. Uh, a person who is an engineer working in fluid dynamics brings his knowledge uh, from being a cyclist and trying to minimize wind resistance. And then diversity in application. People have different objectives, have different goals, are trying to do different things. And 
if everybody was trying to do the same thing in society, society would collapse. We need different things. We need some people to be farmers, other people to be plumbers, other people to be electricians, and so on. We need some people to be trying to earn money, some people trying to earn fame, some people trying to find new knowledge, some people just trying to have good friends, some people looking at to the future, some people looking to the past, all kinds of different objectives are what create this possibility for diversity. So that's one condition. Another condition is autonomous, aut autonomy. You cannot get diversity with autonomy. Uh, people need to make their own decisions about what they believe, what their values are, what they want to do today. All of you who are in this room should be in this room because you want to be in this room. Just one of the things that I say that one of the things that makes my talks great is you can leave. You don't have to stay. Interactivity. Um, clearly you need interactivity in order to create a network. But what we need to understand is that the interactivity in a network isn't just about passing content from one person to another person to another person. Networks are what we call plastic. Uh, Paul Churchland wrote a book called Scientific Realism and the Plasticity of Mind. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that he's talking about. A network isn't static. It doesn't stay the same shape always. It grows, it develops, connections get formed, connections get stronger, connections get weaker. I had people I knew when I was 20 that I don't know anymore. Connections change. I'm sure all of you have Interactivity is like that. Interactivity creates connections. Interactivity allows connections to, to change, to be stronger, to be weaker. The way the network changes is how the network learns. And then finally, openness. Openness among participants, allowing perspectives, allowing new experiences, allowing new information. The network isn't static. It doesn't have walls. It has doors and bridges. That was a nice line. I should keep that one. I think it's been used. So, so what skills are needed to support this? Well, to different ways of looking at it. I had a, a nice, long, and engaging conversation yesterday with Doug Belshaw. So this is right at the top of my mind right now. Uh, this is a map. Remember, we talked about creating maps and analysis as one of the major functions of a provider of network learning. Here's a map. Uh, and this is a map of web literacy. And we, we talked about it a bit and we battered it around. But I think it's correct in its overall structure. And we looked at the major areas here exploring and from uh, the Mozilla Foundation who created this exploring or browsing is probably primary navigation web mechanics search things like that second major area is building or creating that's pretty important uh, you can't talk to somebody else unless you compose a sentence in order to talk to them um, but there are, there's more to building than just coming up with sentences in your mind. Uh, you know, the whole question of creativity and, and where stuff comes from is important. Uh, remixing, repurposing, uh, and then principles of design, principles of accessibility, and even the mechanics and grammar, coding, scripting to get that message shaped and ready to go out there. And then finally, the third aspect is connecting. Uh, I think of it that as more as communicating or sending your message out there. What are the principles of sharing? How do you share? How do you collaborate? How do you participate in the community? Um, these are also elements that are essential. So you can study this framework at your own leisure. It's certainly valuable and, and worth the effort, and I would recommend that you do that. 
But it's not the only way to look at the same thing. Here's another almost totally different perspective of getting at the same underlying concept. This is presented by Harold Jarkey, a friend of mine, just down the road in a town called Sacksville. Uh, and he represents the same thing as seek, sense, and share. So that's a bit different emphasis, right? Um, on one hand, we have discovering. On the other hand, here we have seeking. Uh, he, instead of talking about creating, he talks about sensing. But what he means in this representation is sense making. And there's a school of thought, isn't there, that all creativity, all communication even, is some sort of sense making. I'm not sure I agree with that, but still. And then finally, the third part, the passing forward, the sharing, um, which he underlines as being informed by things like transparency or narration. It's the same kind of thing that we have happening here, right? Uh, it's, you know, like input processing output. Um, and that's kind of a generic model. We need to be careful. I don't have a slide on this, but I, I put this in my newsletter just the other day. Um, when we present it that way, it's kind of one directional, isn't it? Uh, you know, you get stuff, you process it, you send stuff. And, and neurons actually work that way, and a lot of things actually work that way. But there's, you know, when we're thinking of it conceptually, there's no reason we need to think of it as directional. We can get, process, and send right back to where we got it from. Um, you know, that's a, a feedback kind of mechanism. The idea here is that although stuff comes in, although stuff goes out, it's not fixed, it's not rigid, it doesn't happen according to some plan. Um, it's just that these are three aspects of what is a united organic process. I haven't tried to say that in quite this way before, so I hope that worked. In my own work, uh, when people ask how I think people should learn in a network, I use what I call the cog dog model, which is named after Alan Levine, who calls himself cog dog, and his blog is called cog dog's blog, because his favorite things are bicycling, cog, and dogs, dog. So cogs, dogs, blogs, okay. Anyhow, so my model is the is the um, cog dog model and it's A R F F or ARF, which is of course a dog barking. Aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. I don't have a slide for that, sorry. So aggregate bring stuff in from many different diverse sources. That's why I use the word aggregate, not just experience, not just seek, but get everything in, right? You might do some filtering, that's fine, but the idea is you want to open yourself to input. Then remix, that's the explicit joining of things together from different sources. Uh, sometimes we call them mashups. Uh, you know, we take something from here and something from here and put them together, see what we get. Repurpose. Once we have whatever we have put together, then we reshape it. We refine it. Maybe we translate it. Maybe we move it and look at it from a different perspective. And then finally, feed forward. We share it. We spread it out to the rest of the world. So that, that's my, my version of the model. It doesn't matter exactly how you frame this. None, none of these representations is more right than the other. 
the idea here is that we're, we're looking for this underlying pattern, right? So what do you need in order to do these three things? I'm going to dive a little deeper here. So what do you need? What skills do you need in order to be able to aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward? To my mind, again, subject to empirical validation, subject to experience, probably your perspective will be a little bit different, and that's good, not bad. These are the critical literacies. These are the fundamentals for being able to learn in a learning network environment. Syntax, structures, patterns, rules, principles, axioms, anything that is structural, anything that is repeated, any kind of pattern that you see over and over again falls under the heading of syntax. Semantics, having to do with truth and falsity, having to do with good and bad, correct and incorrect, desirable and undesirable, anything to do with values or objectives. The meaning of something. Pragmatics. This is the use of a thing. What it's good for. Why you would even bother. Some people say meaning is use, like Wittgenstein, and there's an element to that, but for our purposes, we'll keep them separate. Cognition. What, how do we infer? How do we think using these? What counts as reason? What counts as an argument or an explanation? What are the principles of reasoning? Uh, if I tried to make a prediction in this area, how would I do it? Context. How does environment matter? How does my perspective matter? What other perspectives are there? Where am I? What am I doing? Uh, you know, how is whatever I'm saying embedded in a wider culture, a wider language, a wider community. And then finally, change. Uh, how do I understand how things change? Um, what are the ways in things change? What are the ways in which this thing is going to change? Uh, how can I predict that change? How can I avoid being misled by incorrectly predicting change? Now, we could talk for a long time about each one of these literacies in detail. I would love to do it. I have deep ideas in all of these things. They occupy a lot of my time. But what I'm trying to do here is to outline what the basics are. And here's why. A lot of people criticize online learning, and especially the online learning that takes place in networks, such as in the massive open online courses that we've developed. And they say, well, people really need to be skilled already in order to be able to learn in this way. You know, and they say things like, uh, you know, they're, they're learning on their own. They need to have more capacity than they would in order to learn with a teacher. And my response is, all learning requires literacy. A person sitting in a classroom requires a certain set of literacies too. They need to be able to read and write. That's why we define literacy as reading and writing. And they do need to be able to read and write in order to sit in a classroom and learn from a teacher. They're not born with these skills. You have to teach them. They need to learn how to function in a social environment, how to behave in a classroom. These are kinds of literacies, right? So no matter how you were learning, 
you need to acquire some basic literacies in order to learn. It's not unique to network learning that you need basic literacies. It's just that these literacies are different. And if we understand what these literacies are, we can think about how to teach them to children so that they can learn in this connective, in this network kind of way in the future. So my approach, my thinking is, we teach them not just the rules of syntax, but how to recognize and create and identify rules of syntax as they go from one domain to another domain to another domain. We don't just teach them the rules of semantics. We teach them how to recognize value, how to recognize meaning, how to determine for yourself whether something is true or false, and so on for the rest of it. By providing basic skills in these critical literacies, then as they move from environment to environment, they can become literate in that environment for themselves. If I was designing a school system from the ground up where people begin in kindergarten, uh, you know, at a very young age, I would focus on these things. I would say, these are the basic underlying principles we want people to learn. One might ask, what happens if we don't develop these skills? Well, if we don't develop the skills, then we lose that capacity. This is a, a cartoon. Two pigs talking to each other. Isn't it great, says one. We have to pay nothing for the barn. And the other pig says, yeah, and even the food is free. Of course, we know what the future life event of a pig is going to be. Uh, in my case, it's bacon, sometimes pork chops, and definitely ham. Uh, okay, that's a bit graphic. But the principle is right. Um, the article in Forbes by Scott Goodson is trying to say, if you don't pay for your online services, then you are the product. Um, you are the thing that's being sold. You become a commodity. And let's think about that for just a second, what that means. What that means is that your thoughts, your ideas, your creations, your attention, your earnings, the money you earn, are things that are actually kind of owned by someone else who in various ways manipulates you so that they can be consumed by others. Uh, you know, take, let's take Facebook as an example. They give you Facebook for free. You upload a picture to Facebook. You created the picture, but now Facebook owns it, sort of, in a way, and can do whatever they want with that. Even if they don't own it outright, you have given Facebook basically permission to do whatever they want with that image. So what Facebook does is it turns around and says, this person is interested in that thing. It becomes data that they can sell to another company. Well, Goodson is talking about uh, paying for you know, these online services, but even if you pay for the service, you still become the product, right? Because you are still in a position where what you are providing, whether it's the money or the creativity or whatever, is owned and passed on by someone else. You don't have the capacity, even, to create new value. 
uh, you know, suppose you were not able to come up with a new idea on your own. Let's, it's an extreme example, but let's imagine that. So the only the only ideas you ever get are ideas that you got from television, say, right? Well, think about this. People compete to control that television to put an idea into your head. They pay a lot of money for that. In fact, advertising is based on that principle. So now somebody has put an idea in your head. Why would they do that? Because there's something about you that they want to consume. They want your money. They want your vote in an election. They want your support for a social cause. They want you to join their religion. They want you to do stuff for them. They want you to fight in an army. They want you to sacrifice your life. You become something that is used by them for their own purposes. And that happens simply and solely because you are not able to create your own ideas. That one simple premise turns you from something that is individual and autonomous to something that is used for something else. In the terms of Immanuel Kant, it turns you from being an end in itself to being a means to someone else's end. Now, if you're good with that, fine. Yeah. Most, most people are not good with that. So, I think that the alternative is to think of learning as fundamentally and importantly about developing the capacity to create new ideas. And that means, I think, that learning fundamentally and importantly has to be network learning rather than, as Paolo Freire called it, the banking theory of learning. Fundamentally, learning must be about being able to interact and create through interaction on our own or cooperatively with other people. The skills, these skills are supported with different elements of network technology. This is just a quick survey of some of the skills that, that support this. They're drawn from Jane Hart, and Jane Hart talks about a variety of tools. Um, and if you explore her site, you'll find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tools to support net learning. This is a bit of a map of those tools, if you will. And again, I could have drawn this out in different ways, but some of the tools that help you create are blogging and authoring tools. Calendar, calendar tools help you interact with each other. Podcasting is another broadcast tool. Feed reading is a tool for aggregating or bringing content in. She calls them on that page RSS readers. Collaborative mapping and drawing tools. Again, these are ways of interacting with each other. Microblogging and messaging, things like Flickr, Facebook, etc. Or better, uh, Identica or tools that we can run ourselves. And then other publishing tools. The idea is that these are all tools about literacy, or these are all tools that support the literate exchange, the literate interaction with each other. I just want to bracket a remark. When we interact with each other, we're not just interacting anymore with words and sentences. We used to. That used to be pretty much it. But in the 20th century, especially, and now into the 21st century, our capacity to interact through other media has exploded. 
and we use many, many different kinds of languages to interact with each other. Right now I'm interacting you with, with you in English, which is a grammar-based, text-based, word-based kind of language. But also, and this is why I use the video, I'm interacting with you using body language, where I use gestures. You don't always see when the, when the uh, slide is up, you don't see, but I'm still gesturing. I use gestures and facial expressions, and that's a kind of language. I'm also using pictures, and there's a whole grammar, a whole syntax of pictures. People interact physically, they interact through music, through dance, they interact artistically. When I travel to a new city, I look at the architecture, I look at the roads, I look at the people on the street, and the question I ask myself is, what is the city saying to me? What, are the, what message? are the people in the city trying to convey. When I go into a forest, I look at the forest the same way, as though the forest is talking to me, as though it's communicating. Now, of course, there's no intentional agent behind the forest, or at least I don't think there is, but that does not mean that I cannot treat my, what I experience in the forest as a form of communication which allows me to comprehend it, which allows me to interact with it. I walk through a forest and I can follow a trail in a forest that to somebody who lives in a city would be invisible because I've had more experience interacting with and communicating with the forest. And it's, just, it's the same sort of thing for any discipline or any domain. Uh, learning to be a chemist is like learning the language of chemistry, where the language is more than just the text and the rules and the principles, but it's the whole mechanism of interacting. So when we look online, we're going to see a lot of tools for all kinds of different subjects. There are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different tools. But you can look at those tools, and now you can look at them with a bit of a deeper understanding and ask, how are they helping me be literate in the sense of critical literacies with this field, right? Is it just a tool for reading? Well, that's pretty narrow, right? Is it a tool that helps me interact? Is it a tool that helps me create? And you can even take that up a level and ask yourself, do these tools, this chemistry tool, this engineering tool, does it support the semantic principle? Does it support diversity? Many file types, many perspectives, many languages. Does it support autonomy? That's the big problem with Apple. Apple knows better than you what you want to do. I prefer a tool that lets me choose what I want to do. Does it support interactivity? Can you communicate with other people using it? A tool that lets you communicate is better than a tool that doesn't. That's one of the big advantages of the network over a book. Books are one way. I can't talk back to the author. I hate that. When I'm reading a book, you know, I'm reading War and Peace, and Leo Tolstoy is unfortunately long dead, but I want to talk to him as I read, and in my mind I do, actually, and so on. So we can think of, you know, if we think of the domain of inquiry, you know, whatever subject we're thinking of, whatever activity we're talking about, thinking of it as a language with multiple forms of literacy as described, we can now understand at a more deep level these tools that we're looking at. Okay, related to all this, very definitely related to all this, is the question of who owns information, all right? And 
I've, I've put a hand running through wheat. That's wheat. It's not a very good image, but trust me, it's wheat there for a very specific reason. Um, today, people manufacture seeds. They manufacture new strains of wheat. The very concept of wheat, what wheat is, is private property. Um, it's owned by companies like Monsanto. Uh, I don't know the others, but you know, uh, it's owned by companies who create new strains of these agricultural products. The concept of farming even is becoming owned. And this is for better or worse, I'd say worse, but I don't get a say in the matter, a trend that is pervading society. Uh, you know, and, and it has a lot to do with the fact that value is defined by financial value infuses everything. In the United States now, in several states, there's a law that says you cannot create, or sorry, you cannot collect in barrels the rainwater that falls on your property. Because that rain, even before it exists, is presumed to be owned by someone else. And so if you collect the rain that falls on your property, you are stealing that rain. It's a remarkable concept. Uh, and like I say, it's, you know, I think it's for the worst that this is happening. But let's suppose that it is happening. Let's suppose that everything is owned. Everything we can think of, everything we can conceive of is owned. It's either owned by an individual or it's owned by a corporation or an institution or it's owned by a government, say. Well, who owns information? Who owns the stuff in your head? Who owns the things that you create? This is a really important question. There's been so much talked about over the years about copyright online, uh, you know, about people downloading songs and, and ripping DVDs and, and sharing stuff that they should not share. Um, but it seems so far to be very one-sided. It's about other people protecting their ownership of stuff from you. My question turns this around. What do you own? Well, you don't own the stuff. You don't own my slide presentation. You don't own the words that you're hearing right now, um, etc. In an important way, you only own what you create. You only own what you are. But I've already talked about ways in which, you know, if you turn yourself into a commodity, what you create, what you are, can even be become owned by someone else. You, you know, slavery is illegal, but for all practical purposes, you can become a human resource, if you will, and in English, I don't know about Spanish, but in English, the words have a common sort of meaning, right? But a human resource is something that is in a certain way owned by a company that the company uses in order to produce value. So, how do you define what you own and how do you maintain ownership of what you own? This is as important an aspect of learning as the creation of the stuff in the first place. Right? If you come up with an idea, if you come up with new knowledge, how do you use that? How does that grow? How does that change? How does that develop? How do you turn that into other things? And as a bracket, can you see here, this is a meta comment, can you see here I'm applying my own principle of literacy 
to the concept of literacy and ownership. I'm asking not just what are the principles of ownership and what's the meaning of ownership, but I'm also asking about how do we use ownership, how do we infer using ownership, how does ownership change, and so on. So these are important questions. They fall typically under the heading of what we call digital citizenship. And dis digital citizenship kind of, if you will, defines the ways that we interact with the rest of society. Uh, how do I want to put it? Some people say, I don't totally agree with them, but some people say this is kind of like the social contract that we draw with the rest of the world that defines what our footprint or what our position or what our degree of ownership is in the world. Uh, the concept of a social contract is old. Uh, you know, it's developed by people like Thomas Hobbes, who says basically the social contact, the social contract is um, I give up all of my rights to the king, and the king protects me from other people. Uh, not much of a social contract, if you ask me, because what protects me from the king? Nothing. But that's the beginning. Uh, more recently, we have people like John Rawls, who define a social contract as defined by what a community of fair-minded people would come up with if they were placed in a position of not knowing what their roles were in society. So you don't know whether you'll be rich or poor. You don't know whether you'll be English or French. You don't know whether you'll be black or white. How would you describe society not knowing any of these things? He says that's what the social contract would be. And he comes up with a principle of justice as fairness out of that. It's not a bad principle, but there's been a lot of criticism of the mechanism by which he arrives at that. So this digital citizenship covers these sorts of things. There are other ways besides social contracts of getting at that. Some people talk about natural rights. Some people talk about survival of the fittest, social Darwinists. I don't really like those people, but it's an approach. Different aspects. Literacy, which is in here, is just one aspect. And literacy is the mechanisms and methods we use to communicate with each other. Etiquette goes a bit beyond that. So how do we be polite to each other? How do we be nice to each other? How do we indicate friendship? Or how do we indicate that someone's an enemy? Access, security, and this is, you know, now we're talking about Hobbes again, health and wellness, commerce, what do you own, what do you not own, what are the principles of property, communication, rights and responsibilities, and law. So these elements constitute the sorts of things that you want to be thinking about when thinking about network learning. It's a whole domain over and above what you would think about when you think about learning in the traditional sense. But you know, these all underlie the kind of things you need to know and the kinds of things that relate and impact on learning. And, you know, I, I take something like this and I use it to analyze education policy. So let's propose some sort of educational policy. Uh, teachers should be judged on the results of student achievement tests, say. Let's suppose that's the policy. Uh, now I look at it, well, what's the impact of literacy on that policy? Well, if there's a presumption of equality of literacy, isn't there, if people are being judged on the outcomes of tests? Or do you adjust the test 
to match different levels of literacy. Here's the element of security. How well can you take a test if there's somebody at the front of the classroom with a gun? There's the, uh, the question of wealth. How well can you learn if you are not nourished, if you are not fed? I've made the statement before, and I'll stand by it again. The single most effective thing that governments can do to improve learning outcomes in a society is to feed children. Give them good, nutritious meals from day one. And first of all, not only will they all be taller, they will be, by the way, they will all be smarter. They will all get better test grades. Want to improve test grades, feed them. They don't do that because they're focused strictly and solely on them remembering the content of the textbook. But if we look at learning from this kind of perspective, then you feed the children. Commerce, how much do they have to pay for learning? It's a key aspect to how much you can learn. Communication, what is the capacity to communicate? What is the right to communicate? These are all important as well. And of course, law. So I think of, of these aspects as important and as underlying, however we're going to define or frame network learning. There's a, there's a model out there, it's called the Posse model. The Posse model tries to, if you will, codify how value is created in this sort of picture. Uh, and again, we come back to that core underlying kind of principle, right? The, the, the production and distribution of contents. So we're talking about creating value. So we're acquiring or aggregating for sure, but now when we're making stuff for ourselves, making new learning, making new property, making new anything, it's the aspects of producing and distributing content. And the core of the Posse model is the simple idea that the better you produce and distribute content, the more you will earn. Uh, so, and this is the approach that I take when people say, well, what's the value of this? What's the value of connectivism? Why should we as an economically based society even care? Because, and I say to them, we are giving our society the capacity to produce and distribute things. Content is just one thing. I view society a bit wider than that, but we're giving people we give them these basic literacies, we give them the capacity to produce and distribute. And that means they can earn more. And that's true of a person, that's true of a society, and it's true of media, it's true of grain production, uh, it's true of plumbing. What's a plumber do? A plumber produces skills and abilities in pipes, and water treatments and things like that and then but simply knowing all of this and having the tools and all of that that does not help the plumber a bit the plumber also has to be able to distribute this get out there in people's homes and fix their pipes the plumber has to be able to do both and it's the combination of both of these things that produce as well traditional education focuses so much more on the first than on the second. Even if it gets us being creative, we still have to get to the part of being interactive. And, you know, as an aside, you might think that's sort of silly. I've seen brilliant, brilliant scientists fail and struggle in their career because they cannot articulate the great idea that they've had. And, what, <laughs> and then they become commodities because what happens is they struggle, they try, and finally someone gets the message, they, they understand or comprehend the insight, and then they turn around and sell it and get all the credit and all the glory for that happens all the time, all the time. 
and you know the the scientists or the you know the people who are famous that you've probably heard of one of their key skills is almost certainly the capacity to communicate and distribute content you look at anyone you see in the media you know learning anywhere they are good communicators that's true of me too right? certainly it's something I spend a lot of time and a lot of effort on and it's not because I can think of this as something over and above what I do I see this as core to what I do it's a part of what I do it's if I want to produce value not just for myself but for the world I need to focus on all of these things so here's a visual representation of the posse model whoops sorry about that uh, it's taking a little bit to, to for these things to show up on the screen um, so and we can break it down a little bit more and this is a model by Daniel Goodall um, producing content the content that is owned that's the stuff that we actually produce ourselves and then the content that is social that's the content that we've sent out into the world and we don't control it anymore and then distributed content the content that we actually paid to distribute but also there's content that is distributed because other people distribute it for us and that's the seeded content and all of those forms of content together go to combine to create what we call earned uh, media the, the, the sum total but again this is not just a model of a media this is a model that applies generally with respect to production and knowledge and ideas so you, you can examine Goodall's theory in more detail at the link and these slides of course will be available to you after because I distribute my slides because I want them to be effective and if they're more effective I produce more value with them so how does that relate to you how does that relate to your students there's a thing a movement if you will out there today called indie web uh, or Jim Groom talks about it as the, the reclaim movement as in reclaim the web and the idea here is that people take back control of their own work their own learning their own creativity their own ideas and here is a couple of underlying principles from something called an indie web camp and you notice and it's not accidental the similarity of the name indie web camp and edgy camp it's the same underlying principle in action here right and first of all your content is yours it belongs to you it does not belong to a corporation uh, you know, and the next sentence here says too many companies have gone out of business and lost all their users data they don't have to go out of business to do that uh, examples can be found every day a blogger by the name of Charles LeBlanc uh, here in New Brunswick he writes a lot of political stuff they call it an election here and all of a sudden his blog which is hosted by Google disappeared because somebody complained to Google if you own your own content that doesn't happen to you but if Google owns your content it does uh, someone oh I forgot her name um, had a LinkedIn or so LinkedIn or Facebook had a, a social network profile and again someone complained they wiped out her social network all her connections all her friends everything no appeal no trial no compensation if you don't own your content it belongs to someone else it's used by someone else and you can't count on it 
Another aspect, you are better connected. Um, and this, this is the idea here that what you, you, you write in one place and you publish in many. And this is what I do. Teach is to model and demonstrate. I write a post or a blog post or something like that. And then that post goes to Flickr, well not Flickr, it's a, po it's a post. It goes to Twitter, it goes to Facebook, it goes to Google Plus, uh, it goes to LinkedIn, it goes to my website, it goes out by email to people. And, and the idea here is that no company, no one organization owns the channels of communication between me and other people. I had, I had a discussion with Doug Belshaw yesterday because Mozilla likes to say that the web is owned by nobody um, and it's you know a public resource we all hold in common. But as I pointed out to him, that's not true. Everything is owned under our hypothesis, which means the web is owned. And if we actually analyze it, different bits of the web are owned by different companies and different individuals. You know, there's a wire connecting you and me right now, an actual physical wire. Uh, part of it might be microwaves, but you know what I mean. There's a physical connection. Someone owns that physical connection. And if they disapproved of us, they could cut us off. Finally, third, you are in control, right? Uh, you can post anything you want in any format you want, even in private if you want. You can share links, you can share ideas, you can share content, etc. Now, and think about it. You know, we we, we kind of have the same sort of underlying element here in indie web that is is supporting the creation of value, right? It's production and distribution. And what indie web is saying, we own our own production, we own our own distribution. Indie web is saying we gain the value out of what we produce. How does that translate to learning? We gain the value out of what we learn. When we create something, whether it's an idea, a diagram, some notes, a map, whatever, as we learn, it's ours. When we interact with people while we're learning, we interact not just with a teacher or an examining board or whatever, but with a collection, a network of people. And we're in control. We choose what we want to learn. We choose what resources we are going to use to learn it, what format we're going to learn in it. We can learn privately if we want. Um, we can have a collection of resources. We can have links to resources. We have access to the materials and the contents we need in order to learn. So. That's basically what I wanted to talk about. And for Diego's perspective, here's the summary of what I wanted to talk about today. A conversation about the challenges and future of network learning, trying to provide a broad understanding of the meaning and potential of network learning, which I think we've looked at that helps educational institutions and also teachers think and rethink about their role in supporting network learning beyond the provision of the LMS and centralized learning systems, the skills that are needed, both from the perspective of the provider, but also from the perspective of the learner, the risks that we run if we don't develop those skills, the kind of technology and some principles about the technology that supports the development of those skills. And then the relation between this and value, the relation between this and turning our, our education, our learning into something which is good for us, that produces value, whether material or other for us, and then some models 
of this under the headings of digital citizenship or posse's context or indie web. That's all I have to say. If I try to advance my slide, you'll see I get nothing. Um, so, Diego, perhaps we'd like to turn it over to discussion and conversation and such. Yeah, Stephen, thank you. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a few things here and uh, try and make people talk uh, to each other uh, for a little while. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you can even get a glass of water. Does that sound right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and well, it's, it's, as a, it's, it's, you can see, actually, it's two or three in Colombia, it's in 2006, ya no sé cuánto tiempo es eso. Eh, ocho años, tal vez. Estuvo eh, aquí en un evento de RENAC, de la Red Nacional de Tecnología Avanzada. Y fue en esa oportunidad que invitamos que yo creo la. la pues tuve la, digo yo la fortuna de conocerlo, porque el, el, eh, tuve la oportunidad de conversar con él en esa época y una cosa que recuerdo eh, del tiempo que tuve de conversar con él es que yo sentía mi cabeza como haciendo un esfuerzo grande, no solo por el idioma, sino por, sino por tratar de entender qué era lo que me estaba diciendo, pero lo cierto es que eh, sirvió de punto de entrada para un montón de cosas que se pues, convirtieron casi que en mi, en mi destino profesional durante los siguientes años. Eh, y una cosa que al menos para mí es muy interesante es que una y otra vez, eh, como que no nos, al menos para mí, eh, siempre encuentro una cosa simpática cuando encuentro, cuando escucho este diseño, es que hay un tema nuevo que hay por ahí, hay, hay una relación nueva con otros temas, como que el, el, el asunto del conectivismo y conectividad está muy presente aquí. Eh, y lo que queríamos hacer era en parte presentarles un panorama tal vez muy amplio pero con la intención de que empecemos a percibir lo que está en juego, que a veces estamos trabajando en tecnología de educación o en el área en la que estamos trabajando, y, y digo yo, lo digo porque lo he visto en, en, con distintas personas, la sensación que uno tiene a veces es, pues yo estoy trabajando en el aparato y, y es que Google me da servicios y Facebook también y todo bien, yo ya estoy haciendo mucho. Y la intención es justamente que tratemos de mirar un poquito más allá, de elevarnos un poco sobre el problema y ver la perspectiva enorme que hay un juego. Es un asunto social, es un asunto político, es un asunto económico, lo que hay en juego cuando estamos trabajando en esos temas. Y, y hay múltiples miradas de múltiples formas de entenderlo. Entonces, lo que quería proponerles era que, eh, como, son, como fue tanta cosa, tanta, tanta información, en realidad, mmm, que trataron de conversar con la persona que tiene al lado, eh, para tratar de identificar una idea que les llamó la atención, solo una algo que no habían escuchado antes, algo que los dejó con una pregunta, solo una cosa. Eh, entonces los invito a que hablen con la persona que tiene al lado. Si de pronto se conectaron, se desconectaron, eh, una cosa, algo que les quedó, ¿qué quedó? Una, una sola idea. Y con eso retomamos la conversación. Ah, sí, sí. Vamos a abrir los micrófonos de, de las personas que están en línea en este momento. Eh, so, Sifo, what we would be, what I propose was to, to talk to each other uh, for a moment about uh, one, one, just one idea that, that came out of, of your talk. Um, for many of them, it's the first time they they have contact with this idea. So, um, well, we, we're we're going to see where where does it lead. We also open the microphones of everyone. So. Pero esa es una idea, un modo de entender la sociedad. Amartya Sen habla de que no existe un contrato social, que estamos aquí porque caímos. Y entonces más bien lo que tenemos que hacer es ver cuáles son las capacidades que cada uno y juntos podemos desarrollar. Pero no era ni porque ya me iban a que para usted le va a decir a todas las escuelas de chico Sí, sí. Ya me respondió. No 
tenemos el micrófono apagado. Diego, ¿nos oye? Paco, hola. Ah, es que quiero apagar el micrófono para no meter ruido. Ya, ya lo encontré. Te escucho un poco entrecortado. Ah, nomás estoy usando el micrófono para apagarlo, para no meterle ruido a, a la conferencia. Ok. Eh, bueno, eh, pensando en tiempo, eh, no sé, de, de eso que conversaron, ¿qué dudas, eh, dudas o ideas o, o qué surge que quisieran tal vez rebotarles Stephen, y lo mismo eh, aplica para quienes están en, en línea. Eh, ¿Aquí hay manera de pedir micrófono o no? ¿O lo tienen no, o no lo tienen? Lo tengo. Ah, bueno, listo. Eh, no sé, Francisco, Ángela o Jorge, si tienen eh, como algún comentario. Eh, los tres están en línea, entonces, sí, si quieren intervenir, pueden hacerlo. Y, pues, si alguno de ustedes quisiera... Eh, compartir alguna de esas ideas que quedó o una duda que, que, que queda abierta, eh, pues adelante. Si quiere puede ser en español, yo hago la traducción, no, no hay no lío. Cambiamos. ¿Qué ideas sugieren? ¿Qué ideas conversar? Ideas de lo que conversaron hace un momento. Lo más importante, lo que le llamó la atención, no hay respuestas buenas ni malas. ¿Qué le llamó la atención? Pues a mí el esquema donde estaba el de dar sentido y compartir. Pues porque ¿Sí? de alguna manera eso es lo que se vive en este momento con las redes, con lo que se está construyendo. O sea, uno dentro de su contexto busca lo que le interesa, pero entonces empieza a compartir y en, ese, en eso de lo, pues que siempre se habla como de tenemos que desarrollar unas capacidades no solo para recibir información, sino para construir y crear contenidos, por ejemplo. Y en ese sentido es que cobra importancia el tener ciertas competencias, Entonces, el trabajo colaborativo, la mente abierta. Ah, la bueno, la... Se están dando la reflexión, <risa> están haciendo preguntas, están en español, por si quieren. Sí, sí. Eso es un trabajo con este, porque si quieren que va, pero yo creo que... Eso, eso es complicado, no me da igual en fin. ¿Qué toco? ¿Qué hago? Y no, y no lo veo. Eh, entonces, básicamente, eso, pues como. Si la, share. Sí, es la capacidad de. Con Laura hablamos de las eh, grandes competencias de las que él habla, pues todo eso se empieza a. a pues eso empieza a cobrar sentido, porque lo, lo mismo que vos decís, o sea, no es tener una perspectiva de listo. Yo tengo mi herramienta, me casé con cualquiera, pues no sé. Y ahí estoy haciendo algo, pues, no es como darle sentido a todo eso a partir de lo que ocurre en, en el contexto, la parte política, económica, social, las necesidades que tengo, lo que quiero, lo que quiero decir. Entonces, como que para eh, alimentarme y, y, y entregar algo, ese contenido debe estar como como contextualizado y debe seguir pues como la autocrítica y no hablar por hablar ni entregar cosas por entregar cosas, sino cargar eso de sentido. Yo creo que ahí es donde cobra importancia como tener unas muy buenas competencias y, y dentro de esas competencias una de las más importantes es el, el trabajo colaborativo. Okay, um, Stephen, we're talking a bit about uh, some of the ideas that, that... Um, that were important for people here, and we, uh, the first one is the, the six sense share model of, of Harold, um, because well, it's a way to to to, to make sense into to bring into perspective uh, all the things because uh, seek, we are seeking, uh, we are using technology to explore information and stuff, but um, it, it it makes uh, it allows us to see the importance of Uh, creating, uh, the, the, the importance of creating, and that makes sense uh, in the context of the critical literacy that you were talking about. So uh, that's one. Um, if you want to comment, please feel free to do so. Otra idea? Yeah. 
qué parte o cómo construyo mi red y cómo la depuro. Porque muchas veces lo que yo veo es que uno pertenece a muchas redes, saca información de muchas partes, pero como hay tanta facilidad para acceder a tantos contenidos y a tantos temas diferentes, muchos pierden el foco, porque en sí tener un foco y tener una idea como la tuya de esto es lo que me gusta, esto es por donde voy, estas son las personas con las que yo hablo y me interesa hablar, eh, hay muchísimos más que les cuesta como decir, bueno, esto es lo que me interesa a mí y esto es como mi contexto, es eh, muy complicado acotarlo y por eso muchas veces uno se pierde en esa red, que eso es lo que a mí me parece complicado de, de este tipo de, como de aprendizaje. Um, one of the... Daniel here says that one of the challenges that he sees in, in network learning is uh, how do you uh, how do you focus your your network so to speak how do you I mean you're creating a network but how do you choose uh, what things and what people and what stuff to keep in that network and what to to live out uh, because you have this possibility to have access to a lot of stuff. And um, as you said, uh, when, the, when the network grows too big, you can find anything in the end. So um, he, he, he sees that as a, as a, as a real challenge. Uh, any ideas on how to focus your network weaving, so to speak? That's a good question. Um, I'll think about that. One, one of the principles, because it, it involves a lot of things, right? One of the principles that I often talk about is it's easier to search for what you want than to filter out for what you don't want. Uh, you know, I, you know, a lot of people think that you know you can consume everything, um, but but nobody can consume everything. So it's important to go in having a sense of. I don't want to say having a sense of what you're looking for, but I want to say it's important to go in having a sense of what you're interested in. Here, an example of this is one of the, one of the questions asked me, asked of me by people is, what should I blog about? And you know, because you know, I tell them, well, you should blog, and I say, about what? I don't know anything. And I'm not interested in anything. That's why I don't blog. I, I'm not good at anything, they say. And I said, all of that is false. You already know what you liked. And what you need to do is be reflective and open yourself up to experiencing your own experiences. That sounds a little too mystical, right? So let's make that more pragmatic. Go to your apartment or your home and look around the room, right? Look around the room and see what's there. So if I looked around this office now, very reflective, so a lot of this is pretty intentional, but, but let's say I just looked around this office, right? So, okay. There's something from Portugal, it's a photo I took. That tells me two things. I'm interested in photography. I'm interested in explorers. Okay, so those are two things I'm interested in. That's the diagram of the software that I'm authoring with a, a team of us here. I'm interested in networks. I'm interested in fig trees. I'm interested in books. I'm interested in nature and seashores and things like that. I'm interested in the Toronto Blue Jays, which is a hockey or which is a baseball team. I'm interested in spices. What else? Well, I can go on. but you get the idea, right? So, uh, okay. so. That tells you the kind of things that you want to be looking for. And then the next step, really, it, it is kind of a filtering process. But the next step is cultivating the sources. 
Some people try to say, you know, there are better sources inherently, there are worse sources inherently. They talk about the quality of a source. I don't really like that language because quality is just so subjective in so many ways. But develop a mechanism where you can scan a lot of stuff really quickly. Here's what I do. Remember, to teach is to model, right? Uh, here's, here's what I do. Um, I'll pop it open here. Where's, oh, there it is. Okay, hang on. Takes me a second here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Too many moving parts. I'll tell ya. Come on. Come on. Oh, oh. Okay, here we go. So, this is Feedly. It's my RSS reader. So, check this out. Oops. Oh, let, let, me, let me just present it a different way. Uh, no, there's no easy way. Well, these on this side here, these are all the different feeds that I read. And there are hundreds of them. There are thousands of them, actually. And I will go through these. I better be careful. I don't want to skip stuff. I go through these really quickly. Right. And I really do depend on intuition and first impressions. When you just start doing that, you'll be terrible. You'll miss stuff that's important. You'll focus on the trivial. But over time, you become better. So don't worry about doing it right. It's more about learning to do it. So, and I've searched for feeds that I find that are in areas of interest to me. And it's kind of hard to see here because Feedly is not really designed as a presentation tool. But I have feeds in education. Uh, if I scroll down further, you'll see I have feeds in um, well, lots of education. <laughs> lots of more and more and more education. Uh, are we through these yet? No. Uh, okay, feeds about ideas. Because I have a background in philosophy, interested in ideas. Uh, feeds about business, surveillance, media. I love media, so interesting to me. Meta. I, says, I read Meta Filter. Metafilter is my totally random stuff engine, right? And it's all kinds of people contribute all kinds of stuff to Metafilter. And, you know, every day there might be 60, 70, 80 links. And I don't worry about reading them all because I never do. But I browse through Metafilter. Or I browse through Statistics Canada, right? Who browses through Statistics Canada? I do. When I was a child, I, I would, every year I would order something called the World Almanac. Today, the equivalent is the CIA World Factbook. I'm sorry, but it is. Uh, and you might think, who reads the World Almanac? And if you're wondering what's in it, the Almanac is all the countries, all you know, the maps, the flags. I love flags. You can tell I love flags. There's more if you look for them. Um, uh, you know, capital cities, population, demographics, religion, economy, uh, major, major imports, history, government, etc. Uh, it's just all the nations and all that. Uh, let's read it. Uh, you know, I don't read it cover to cover because you can't, but you know, you just skim it like you skim out a filter, and slowly over time you learn about the world. <coughs> so what happens is, so I cast my net wide, and then I cultivate the sources. And the the best way of knowing that you want to read something is the fact that you read it. And for those of you who are digging through this a hundred years from now, yes, I have borrowed that from John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill said, 
the best proof that somebody's des that somebody desires something is that they actually desire it. That's why they tell you to go look in your room. What are you looking for? Well, you already know because you've already been looking for it. You just haven't seen that. So what are you looking for on the web? Look at what you're reading over and over. Right? If you're not reading something ever, if you're always just skipping over the post, drop it. If you are reading it, promote it. And you, know, you don't need to keep numbers or tallies because over time, you begin to recognize and become familiar with or habituated to the thing you're always reading. So that's the process. You know, I'm probably getting to more, you know, I mean, that's the aggregation process. And then I supplement that, of course, with the remix, repurpose, and feed forward. But the filtering really is test your net wide. Uh, let yourself just sort of experience what's there without trying to analyze it and then be reflective, look and see what it is that actually resonates with you. Um, that's the method I use. Uh, Stephen, just question, by, by any chance do you have an OPML file of your uh, fib list? I always do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, um, I'm not sure. It's just that uh, I remember that you, you used to have a blog lines account also, uh, and what, one of the first things that I did when I when I started reading uh, about educational technology was to uh, download the the list of all the feeds that he read, and I put it in my own feed reader. So now I'm reading what he's reading, so to speak, and. And it was very interesting because it was this feeling of, wow, I'm, I'm having access to all this information, but I started to make sense of it on my own. And so, so it, it's a good yeah. start. That you have a broad uh, view uh, of someone who has more, more experience, but you begin to, to take out the things that you don't need. So it, it, it's a good way to do it. Also, I uh, know, to see who, uh, who someone, who, I don't know how to get it from a so someone, Sorry, okay. Uh, me pasa español. ¿A quién sigue la gente que uno sigue en Twitter? Si Stephen Down sigue a tales personas en Twitter, es porque probablemente las personas son interesantes para leer. Entonces uno las agrega a su red. Y es una forma de ir agrandándola, pero no, no de manera caótica, sino cultivando esas fuentes, como decía Stephen. Eh, Paco, comentarios, ¿algún comentario? Sí, Diego, eh, bueno, agradecerte la invitación. And I want to thank you. We want to thank you, Stephen Downs, for this conference. When uh, you were talking about the digital citizenship, I remember a book written by the anthropologist Ian Hoder, Entangled. And in that book, he says, Oh, it shows how the way we are living is decided or is because some decisions other people have taken in the time, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And we think mm -hmm. we are in time to re reflect, to think about the city, digital citizenship that will make a better humanity. That's um, my comment. That's my reflection when you were talking about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I would underline that, and I, I think that's a good thing to highlight. When we make decisions, even small decisions, we're never making a decision just for ourselves. Uh, we're always making a decision for the rest of the world. Um, you know, sometimes that's really obvious. You know, if you're Ronald Reagan and you uh, start a nuclear war, it's pretty clear you're making a decision for the rest of the world. But even the small decisions that you make, 
have a wider impact and, and sometimes have a global impact. And I think it's thinking, you know, not yeah, every minute of every day, but when you're being reflective, thinking about are the sorts of decisions that I'm making, you know, are, are they going to result in a better world for people a hundred years from now or a worse world? And it's certainly something that I think about when I make decisions. Um, you know, everything from the food that I eat to the clothes that I wear to the sorts of things that I say in talks like this, I try to think not just uh, how does this help me? You can't just think of that. You have to think of how does this help others and how does, does this help people a hundred years from now? As an aside, this is a bit of unsolicited advice, but it's great advice and it's directly related because I talked about the importance of communication. Um, the really important trick, it's not a trick, but I'll call it that, to communication, and again, I'm stealing it from someone else, is this. Love your audience. And you might think, well, that's pretty stupid. But that's okay. It's okay. Think about why you are communicating. Right? Uh, and, and think about why other people are listening to you. And if you take the attitude and the the perspective that, first of all, they're listening to you because they really want to hear you. That's first. And second, that you are speaking because you want them to get the most benefit possible. Then all your hesitation and all your doubts and all your fears about communicating go away. They go away because you're giving, not taking. They go away because you are being generous and you are helping other people do things. You know, people aren't fearful when they're giving stuff away. People are only fearful when they're taking. People aren't fearful the, about gaining things are only fearful about losing things. So if you speak, if you think of yourself as focused in that way, it really does help in your presentation. And that's probably a good model, generally. I mean, Bob Dylan sang in a different context, you got to serve someone. Um, the idea here is that Meaning, value, relevance, and purpose in life is developed by helping others, not by helping the self. And you can test that empirically. You know, it's not some kind of ideology or, or, or you know, uh, mystical principle or something like that. You can test it empirically. Uh, look at your own life again. Be reflective and ask whether the things that were most meaningful happened in your life when you got something or when you helped someone else. Um, and, and over time, the aggregate, because you can always think of individual examples, but over time the aggregate, what builds a good life is how much you're able to do for others. Um, and you know, it's the same line of thinking that informs, you know, thinking about the impact your decisions have and the effect that they will have a hundred years from now on the rest of humanity. I know this has nothing to do with educational technology, but this underlines and informs my perspective on educational technology. So I think it's important. Okay. Um, no sé si alguien tiene algún otro comentario. Bueno, 
Eh, en línea, ¿alguien tiene algún otro comentario? Creo que tenemos a dos personas que están conectadas aún. Eh, Ángela Valderrama, Paco. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I'm still sharing my screen. How silly. I keep forgetting that. I've been downloading my OPML file. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Oh, well, all um, my gestures and... <laughs> yeah, we, we get all of that. <laughs> okay. oh, sorry. Okay, so, Stephen, thank you very much for this... For this uh, couple of hours of, of sharing your thoughts. I think uh, it, was, it was a very broad and, and very interesting uh, thing to hear. Uh, and well, at least for me, it, it, a lot of, I'm, I'm out with a lot of questions, a lot of new questions, and I, I really appreciate that. It's always important to, to have uh, new, new, new things to think about. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I, I really hope that you, you make it to Pereira next week and maybe uh, we'll have a chance to talk, okay? So thank you very much, have a good day and uh, in, in, in the name of AFID University and Proyecto 50, thank you so much for, for this conference. Thank you for having me, it's been my pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.